important thing to understand is that uh, there's been a lot of a lot of the, the the things that we may say tonight that may sound like rather bland assertions and uh, rather uh, perhaps unsupported assertions. Um, again, we recommend to you that you go back and listen to some of the earlier broadcasts because we've covered this stuff in almost nauseating depth. But when we're talking about the Iran Contra scandal as or the Iran Contra hearings, especially, you're talking about essentially the absolute thinnest possible uh, upper layer of skin off of the uh, the big filthy onion of, uh, of politics, uh, especially the politics of the last uh, uh, seven years, namely the Reagan administration. The Iran Contra case is uh, a vastly more important series of events than the fact that uh, we sent some uh, some Stinger missiles to Iran and uh, we made some uh, illicit dealings with the uh, with getting uh, weapons to the Contras. In fact, it uh, it happens to go down very very deep into the the, the fabric of our our national politics and our international politics, and uh, it. Basically, what it is is we're we're talking about a uh, a, a government inside a government that uh, pays no allegiance what's allegiance whatsoever to the Constitution or the mandate of the American people, but rather a group of people who consider themselves to be, in fact, one would have to guess, America personified and uh, feel there's no need for them to consult anybody else. And they have been making policy and then defending that policy uh, for the past seven years or so, and even, of course, long before that. But for our purposes, what we're talking about, making and defending that policy with every power at their disposal, including the bumping off of witnesses, lying, cheating, stealing, treason, just about everything you can name. Now, uh, as we said at the top of the broadcast, and for the benefit of those of you who will be eventually hearing this on tape, we're going to be two doing two programs on the iran Contragate cover-up. We divided the cover-up into four basic categories of MOs as far as uh, obscuring the information. We're going to cover two of them tonight. We're going to cover suspicious deaths. A lot of people who figured prominently in the investigation in one way or another died either prior to, during, or just after one of the uh, investigations or another were launched and concluded. We're also going to talk tonight about break-ins. A lot of institutions and individuals connected with the iran Contragate scandal in some way had break-ins at their home or offices. We're going to talk about that this evening. Then in Radio Free America number 34, the sixth program about iran Contragate and the second about the cover-up, we're going to talk about curious appointments that were made either to law enforcement positions or to investigative positions vis-a-vis -vis one of the criminal or congressional investigations going on of one aspect or another of the scandal. And basically, to make a long story short, many of the foxes were appointed to watch the hen house, and we're going to be talking about that next time. Also, there were some interesting resignations, some very timely resignations. A lot of people who... Uh, shall we say, might have had their tails salted a bit by this investigation, managed to get out of the aforementioned uh, hen house before the foxes uh, were able to uh, perhaps salt those tails or whatever. A lot of people got gone just before <laughs> their names would have uh, kind of cropped up. That is to say, not died, but uh, scooted for higher ground. Also, next time, we're going to look at various stratagems, thing, various kinds of pressure that were brought to bear in order to obfuscate the situation. People were threatened, lawsuits were filed, uh, people were kidnapped, and uh, we're also going to speculate about some things that may have been done to overshadow, particularly the congressional investigation and the public hearings that were being televised and broadcast on radio. That's what's in number 34. Tonight, we're going to talk about suspicious deaths, and suspicious break-ins, both of which appear to a large extent to have been directed at covering up the iran Contragate scandal. Just to mention before we start broadcasting from Foothill College, this is KFJC Los Altos Hills. Our first article tonight is, in fact, perhaps, uh, and this is the reason we chose it first, perhaps more of a metaphor uh, than, uh, than the rest of our articles tonight, which tend to be more the dirty facts. But uh, one of the things that, uh, that one notices in, in, in covering these kinds of stories and, and researching these kinds of things is the fact that uh, things kind of slip out into the newspapers. The modified limited hangout theory takes effect. Things slip out to the newspapers, um, some pretty grisly things, um, but in and of themselves, not the worst things. But uh, people are so anxious to, to think, okay, that's it. We've gotten it all out now. Um, we found the uh, the root of the problem and it's and it's solved that they tend to stop there when in fact the things that actually are floated out may in fact be floated out on purpose to take some of the pressure off of the people being investigated um, little crimes to do uh, to obfuscate the big crimes but the little crimes themselves are oftentimes metaphors for the larger crimes and that may be what we're dealing with here 
This first article is from the San Jose Mercury News for Saturday, September 19, 1987. The headline is, North's Allies Targeted Legislator, Records Show. The article is by R.A. Zaldivar and Charles Green of the Mercury News Washington Bureau, and it's Dateline to Washington. Conservative fundraisers who worked closely with Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North closely, who worked closely with Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, plan to, quote, destroy a liberal congressman who is investigating North's possible violations of a congressional ban on aid to the Nicaraguan Contras, according to documents released Friday by the House Iran Contra Committee. Handwritten notes from the office of Carl Spitz Channel showed that former Representative Michael Barnes, a Democrat from Maryland, was targeted for defeat last year because, quote, he wants to indict Ollie. Quote, destroy Barnes, use him as an object lesson to others, said the notes. Skipping down in the article. As the former chairman of a House subcommittee responsible for Latin American policy, Barnes was a leading opponent of aid to the Contras. Beginning in 1985, he had pressed the White House on whether North was circumventing congressional prohibitions on aiding the rebels. Quote, Watergate, Watergate babies want to get at the president through Ollie, said the notes. Want another Watergate. Put Barnes out of politics. If we get rid of Barnes, we get rid of the ringleader and rid of the problem, unquote. Channel bought television and newspaper ads to oppose Barnes' unsuccessful 1986 Senate campaign. The winner in a three-candidate Democratic primary was Representative Barbara Mikulski. Now, what happened with Michael Barnes, in and of itself, of course, this is a crime. This is a, a, you know, a, a grotesque attempt to, um, to short-circuit the legislative procedure and the electoral procedure in this country. However, as you'll see by the end of the broadcast tonight, uh, Representative Barnes probably got off pretty easy. Um, again, one last thing before we start this broadcast, for new listeners, not for our old listeners, but for those who still have their One Step Beyond Radio Free America training wheels on, first of all, um, we do again invite you to go back and look at any of our, our uh, archive broadcasts or our One Step Beyond broadcast still available on tape, um, and uh, check into our documentation. We, we, in fact, we encourage it uh, very strongly. Secondly, to bear in mind that the people that we're talking about here, um, it, time and time again, uh, the stuff that, that the kind of stuff that we're talking about now has come out in other cases has been poo-pooed, has been essentially uh, put down as being spurious or being partisan information, and then has proved to be true. The entire Iran Contra case, uh, before it even broke, was put down as being you know political and partisan maneuvering, Watergate the same way. And again, these are only the the tips of the icebergs of these respective cases. Um, all, all sorts of things. The, the John F. Kennedy assassination, which we've talked about a great deal, has been, for years, has been used as a, a brush to tar people with who disagreed with the Warren Commission verdict, and yet when polls of the United States populace are taken, uh, fully two-thirds of the people in the United States think that the Warren Commission report is wrong. So the message is getting out. The thing to do is to not take anything for granted and to listen to the facts and make up your own mind. Now the important, uh, perhaps the single most important thing about that article is uh, the stated intent of Oliver North and his cronies to get Representative Barnes. Now, what we're going to ask you to do as you listen to this broadcast is to evaluate the various deaths of people involved in the investigation in one way or another and ask yourself, perhaps, as we are asking ourselves, whether or not these deaths might also have been attempts by some of the principal players in the Iran-Contra scandal to get, quote-unquote, people who may have been bringing pressure to bear on them in one way or another. That's the operant question here, and uh, as we're going to see, this uh, is not at all a remote possibility, and in fact, there are some very direct hints, even from mainstream sources, that in fact just such a policy was in effect. Research credit on the following goes to one of our listeners who looked this up or found this and then sent it on in to us. This is from the Tower Commission Report, as published by the New York Times and Bantam Books. It's copyright 1987, and uh, I believe it's out in both soft cover and hard cover. This is the Bantam edition that would probably be soft cover. At any rate, on page 169 of the, the Times Tower Commission Report, we find an interesting statement here by Oliver North, and uh, it, it's interesting that... Uh, well, reflect on this also. Reflect on uh, what Oliver North has uh, been talking about here and reflect on some of the people who died of heart attacks during the course of the investigation. Uh, what they're talking about here is, uh, or what Oliver North is talking about here in the uh, appendix section, 
Well, actually, I guess this is not an appendix. This is in the actual body. Another thing he said in was in the appendix. At any rate, what Oliver North is talking about here is a way to see to it that the Iranians kept their end of the deal in the hostage for arms uh, negotiations that were going on. Recall, of course, that in, in order to fuel their war effort with Iraq, the Iranians were obtaining weapons in return for uh, apparent guarantees to get hostages released in Lebanon, and a few, and a few actually were released. Now, of Oliver North's... Uh, attempts and devices to maintain what he calls OPSEC, or operational security, we find the following in the Tower Commission report. Measures have been taken to reduce the chance for duplicity on the part of the Iranians and to preserve a measure of operational security in carrying out the transaction. In the case of a double cross, one of the Iranians will be in the hands of assets we control throughout. One of them has already suffered a serious, though apparently not fatal, heart attack after last week's Hawk transaction failed to produce results. I'm going to read the last sentence again. One of them, meaning one of the Iranians who, will, is, who has been in the hands of pro-CIA, pro Ali pro North assets, one of them has already suffered a serious, though apparently not fatal, heart attack after last week's Hawk transaction failed to produce results. Basically, this is a very intriguing and uh, sinister statement, albeit one that is placed between the lines. What North is really saying here is that, uh, that uh, they will ha have hostages themselves, that some of the Iranians will, in effect, be hostages uh, held by some of their, quote, assets, and that if they double-cross, that after their apparent double-cross the previous uh, week, they were referring to here that to last week's hawk hawk transactions, one of those Iranians had a heart attack. And uh, this is an interesting statement for uh, Oliver North to be making here, because what he's talking about is a way for guaranteeing that there won't be any more double-crosses. The clear implication being that that heart attack was not natural, and that if, uh, if the situation repeats itself, there's likely to be another heart attack, perhaps more serious, with regard to the Iranian hostage in the hands of the Ali North assets. Now, there are a lot of people who, in the course of this investigation, died in very strange circumstances. A couple in particular via died of heart attacks, and we're going to take a look at those. But uh, we, we've spoken on One Step Beyond before, That's the but for the benefit of those who hear this outside of our immediate listening radius, that's a weekly phone-in talk show that Nip and I uh, co-host, and it is uh, sort of the... What would you call it, Nip? It's sort of the, the spire upon which the which, which the foundations of uh, Radio Free America are intended to uphold. It's kind of a roundabout way of putting it, but I think that's that gets to the essence kind of, of poetic, it. Kind of poetic, kind of poetic. At any rate, the uh, what we're going to ask you to consider here is consider Oliver North's state and the the Iran Contra players' stated intent to get Representative Barnes their apparent uh, ability to get any of the Iranians in the hands of their assets, specifically, i.e., giving them heart attacks, and uh, reflect on uh, some of the other deaths, bearing in mind that one of the things we've talked about over the years is the fact that the U.S. national security establishment made as one of its top priorities after World War II means of assassinating people to make it that... Uh, means of assassinating people in such a way as to make it appear to be a natural death or uh, suicide. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, as, since we were talking earlier in the broadcast about using ra Radio Free Americas as a uh, resource, um, we in fact have quoted from declassified government documents discussing just that, which, and these were actually just immediately post-World War II, uh, declassified documents in Radio Free America... Uh, I don't know if we actually... Um, yeah, we did use we used documents and maybe the Ed Wilson ones, the Turple Wilson ones. That may be. I know, we've, I know we've used them in the guns of November. We used documents quite a bit. Uh, well, that's another source where they're available then, which is, uh, which is the, the guns of November series, which are also available from our archive Maybe what service. we can do is stick that at the very beginning of the, uh, the concluding RFA show, well, with that, that one particular memorandum. We have uh, in a book, by the way, called Documents, edited by Stacey, uh, Tr Christy Macy and Stacy Kaplan. It's a soft cover book that came out in either 75 or 76. There's a chilling declassified FBI or DIA, CIA memorandum from 1949 in which they talk about the various means that are, uh, were available at that time to kill people in such a way as to make it appear to be a natural death. Thirty years ago, mind you folks, with much more primitive technologies available. Almost 40 now. Almost 40, yeah, you're <laughs> right. So yeah. this is, not, so this is the, not the kind of thing that we're saying blithely, folks. This is not science fiction talking about giving somebody apparent heart attacks or causing them to have cancer. These are things that are, in fact, uh, according to the government's own documents, things that the CIA, among other uh, organizations, has had the facilities to do for, as Dave mentioned, almost four decades now. So, continuing with those thoughts, uh, let's continue on with uh, what's going to be the March of Mortality fairly soon. This is from the San Jose Mercury News for Tuesday, March 17th. 
1987. The headline is Death Threats Reported in Drug Cases. It's a Washington Post wire story, Dateline, Washington. Federal officials in Miami are taking extraordinary security precautions, including 24-hour bodyguards for the U.S. attorney and the deployment of a police for the U.S. Attorney and the deployment of a police SWAT team at the federal courthouse in response to death threats from Colombian drug traffickers, according to law enforcement sources. The threats picked up by U.S. intelligence officials about two weeks ago were made against U.S. Attorney Leon B. Kellner, an unnamed judge and a Drug Enforcement Administration official, the sources said. The threats come as Kellner's office is prosecuting several high-profile cases involving cocaine smuggling from Colombia. Several of the defendants are tied loosely to the Medellin cartel, spelled M-E-D-E-L-L-I-N. Uh, several defendants tied loosely to the Medellin cartel, an international cocaine smuggling ring believed to be responsible for 80% of the cocaine brought into the United States. Now, for a variety of reasons that we're going to be elaborating on most of these tonight, the Medellin cartel itself is significant because of its, its uh, un... Uh, incontestable connections to the the Contras and the Contra supply effort, and in fact, their uh, fairly apparently fairly large position in the Contra supply effort, and through that, their connection with the American government. We, we by the way, we went we went into that in, in great depth in Radio Free America number twenty nine, the first of our programs on Iran Contragate, the drug connections. That's right. The dr drugs and guns uh, have been paired for a long time. We've done not only the beginning broadcasts of this, but just before that, a long series of stuff on the intelligence service and the drug trade um, on our Radio Free America series. And it's, uh, it's a very important part of the Iran-Contra case, and one that, needless to say, has gotten very little attention in the national media and um, during the hearings themselves, perhaps because of its potential explosiveness. We're going to talk a little later in the broadcast about a, a, a noted cocaine trafficker by the name of Adler Barry Seal, who uh, appears to have played a very key role in the entire Contra operation before meeting with his untimely death. Now, one of the things that's significant about the death threats to Leon Kellner uh, concerns the fact that uh, a lot of uh, people connected with the drug aspect of the Iran-Contra scandal, uh, basically, to make a very long story very short, the Medellin cartel's cocaine was being used to a considerable extent to help finance the weapons purchases for the Contra armies. Now, one of the things we're going to look at now is the fact that, uh, the apparent fact, I should say, that many people who were indeed in connected with the Contra drug traffic uh, passed away under strange circumstances, and, and basically what we're uh, asking you to consider is just how seriously Mr. Kellner should have taken those death threats. Certainly the drug connections to the Iran-Contra scandal have not received the publicity they might have. Uh, we're going to take a look at some of the things that have happened to some of the people involved with either investigating this drug traffic or involved with the drug traffic itself, and we're going to see some of the things that have happened to some of these people. Now, in Radio Free America number 29, we talked about three convicted drug smugglers, all three of whom maintained that they were working for the Contra supply effort. Their names are Mike Tolliver, Gary Betzner, and George Morales. And these individuals were scheduled to testify, in fact, now have testified, before a House Foreign Affairs subcommittee. We're going to take a look at so that, uh, that subcommittee. We're going to take a look at that subcommittee in detail, what happened to one of its late members, and we're going to take a look at some of the information that they might have uncovered or perhaps have uncovered. Repeating an article from Radio Free America number 29, this is from the San Francisco Examiner from April 21st of 1987, that a Tuesday. This is a story by Vince Bielski, B-I-E-L-S-K-I, and Dennis Bernstein. It's Dateline Miami and headline, Sources Tell of CIA's Contra Drug Smuggler Link. In exchange for their help in arming the Contras, CIA operatives helped a network of Miami-based drug smugglers move their illicit cargo into the United States, a range of sources here and in Central America said. The sources, more than a dozen, include congressional investigators, convicted drug traffickers, and others in Costa Rica, Miami, and Washington. The agency turned to smugglers to fly weapons to the Contras in 1984 after Congress banned official USA to the Nicaraguan rebels, said one investigator for a Senate Foreign Relations Committee subcommittee looking into the use of cocaine to fund the Contra war. Uh, interrupting here, that Senate Foreign Relations Committee's front and center, perhaps the single most important aspect of this article. The relationship between the CIA and the smugglers lasted about two years and resulted in thousands of pounds of cocaine, unquote, reaching U.S. cities, the investigators said. It was a marriage of convenience, he said. The agency used smugglers to do what they, what it legally couldn't do. 
In return, the investigator said, CIA operatives allowed the drug smugglers to use hidden airstrips in northern Costa Rica and gave them intelligence information to avoid the surveillance of U.S. drug enforcement authorities. Skipping down, the drug traffickers who accused the CIA of conspiring with them have been convicted on dr drug charges unrelated to their alleged CIA activities. They are serving time in a federal prison in Miami. They are expected to testify before a Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee next month. And again, the individuals uh, concerned here are Mr. Tolliver, Betzner, and Morales. We went into them in detail in RFA 29. We're not going to go into them right now. However, one of the most intriguing things that might have come out had uh, certain, th certain factors not interfered, and we're going to take a look at some of those factors, concerns the relationship between a man who operated under the name of Max Gomez. His real name was Felix Rodriguez. We talked about him, and I believe it was Radio Free America number 31, and his relationship with uh, George Vice President George Bush's uh, national security aide, a man named Donald Gregg. Remember that George Bush was himself CIA director in 75 and 76. He presided over much of the activities of the secret team and was not removed from as CIA director until Jimmy Carter replaced him in 1977. Of course, as we looked at in RFA number 31, right, the Carter regime, it's, or the Carter administration itself, was destabilized to a considerable extent by this very same secret team. At any rate, of the relationship between Max Gomez uh, a.k.a. Philip Rodriguez and Donald Gregg, the national security aide to George Bush, the article from the Examiner of 42187 says the following. Convicted drug pilot Michael Tolliver, T-O-L-L-I-V-E-R, says he also was part of a guns and drug smuggling scheme set up by a man he believed was Max Gomez, according to a deposition given by Tolliver in a federal civil suit concerning drug smuggling in Miami. Gomez, a key figure in the Contra Arms Network, met with Vice President Bush three times in 1985 and 86. A former CIA operative, Gomez also is a longtime associate of Donald Gregg, Bush's national security aide. Gomez is reportedly an alias for Felix Rodriguez. In the deposition, Tolliver said Gomez had paid him about $75,000 to fly, quote, 28,500 pounds of military supplies, unquote, to the Contra's CIA-built camp in Aguacate, Honduras, in March of 1986. As an added extra bonus, Tolliver said he could smuggle his own drug shipment into the United States without ever having to worry about interception or arrest. So basically, two central points of this article. These convicted drug smugglers who claim to have been working for the uh, Contra supply effort and, and uh, people in particular with hard links to George Bush through Felix Rodriguez are maintaining that, uh, well, they, they were getting ready to testify before a Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee and uh, we're going to talk about that subcommittee and uh, speculate on uh, sub what, what might have happened had uh, a certain key member of that subcommittee not disappeared or uh, had a, quote, heart attack, unquote, in the middle of the investigation. We're going to read, I guess, what's more or less an obituary uh, from the San Jose Mercury from March 8, 1987. The headline, Reagan Calls Zarinsky. Quote, a man of courage. The article is from the Mercury News Wire Services, Dateline, Washington. President Reagan on Saturday lauded late Senator Edward Zerinsky of Nebraska as, quote, a man of courage and the people, and principle, excuse me, who took an independent stand because of the strength of his convictions. Zerinsky died late Friday of a heart attack after singing and performing in the o Omaha Press Club's show. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of show we're missing the edge of the article. He was 58 years old. I think it was a variety show. A variety show, show. Yeah. yeah, something ends O-N. Um, as mayor of Omaha, and later a U.S. senator, Edward Zerinsky was a man of the people, Reagan said in a statement. As a senator, he not only had an open door, but an open mind, taking stands on issues because they were right, not because they were popular, Reagan said of the Republican-turned-Democrat. Nebraska Governor Kay Orr, who, all, who also performed at the show, asked that flags be lowered until sunset today in the senator's memory. Zerinsky will leave a major void on the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee, where he headed the most important subcommittee dealing with production and stabilization of prices, and on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where he headed a new subcommittee on terrorism, narcotics, and international communications, according to fellow committee members. Let me just give you the name of the uh, title of his subcommittee again on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where he, Zerinsky, headed a new subcommittee on terrorism, narcotics, and international communications. 
or a Republican must choose someone to serve the remaining two years of Zerinsky's term. She declined to comment on any aspect of the selection process. So Edward Zerinsky, a uh, man whose subcommittee was certainly going to be uh, continue to be involved with the aforementioned drug dealers that Dave was just talking about, and whose reaction to the some of the revelations beginning to come out, we'll talk about in just a moment. Edward Zerinsky uh, died of a heart attack after performing in a charity show of some kind. And uh, again, folks, uh, this is early in the broadcast still, and one can afford to look uh, at uh, heart attacks as being just what they seem, but by the end of the broadcast, uh, heart attack is going to begin to have a slightly more sinister sound. Well, let's look at uh, just what Representative Zerinsky was doing immediately before he attended this variety show. Research credit on this article goes to, again, another one of our listeners who, with his sharp eyes, picked this up and sent it on in. This is from the New York Times of Sunday, March 8th of 1987. It's a story by Keith Schneider of the New York Times. It's Dateline, Washington, D.C., headlined, North's AIDS Linked to Australia Study. Several former military and intelligence officers who helped Lieutenant Colonel Oliver L. North ship weapons to Iran and Central America were closely associated with the co-founder of an Australian financial concern that collapsed in 1980, according to an Australian government investigation. The collapse of the financial concern came amid charges that it had laundered money earned from weapons and illicit drug sales. Among those linked to the failed Sydney-based concern, Nugan Hand Bank, and its co-founder, Michael J. Hand, was Richard V. Secord, a retired Air Force Major General who helped Colonel North conduct airlifts of weapons to the Middle East and Central America, according to the four-year-old Australian investigation. The Australian study, parts of which are still secret, was conducted by the Commonwealth New South Wales Joint Task Force on Drug Trafficking and was completed in March of 1983. Although it is not new, the study is receiving scrutiny again in Washington because of the details it contains about activities and movement of weapons around the world by many of the same figures involved in the Iran-Contra affair. The Australian report, which has stirred congressional interest, also concluded that several former Central Intelligence Agency officials and contract operatives, among them Theodore G. Shackley, Thomas G. Kleins, and Rafael Quintero, were involved in military and intelligence-related activities with Mr. Hand and other top officers of the Nugan Hand concern. The Tower Commission report on the Iran-Contra affair and other published reports have linked all of these men to operations in the Middle East and Central America directed by Colonel North, the National Security Council aide dismissed last November by President Reagan. Mr. Secord and the other men in the network are the focus of a Senate Foreign Relations Committee investigation. The Australian study, a congressional aide said, provides additional evidence that will help the committee determine whether this group simultaneously functioned over the years as official government intelligence agents while also conducting legal and illegal operations for profit. Quote, Given the recent revelations about these men, I am greatly concerned, unquote, said Senator, Senator Edward Zerinsky of Nebraska, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, hours before he died of a heart attack Friday. Again, let me repeat that last sentence. Quote, given the recent revelations about these men, I am greatly concerned, unquote, said Senator Edward Zerinsky of Nebraska, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, hours before he died of a heart attack Friday. Now, we read this article in Radio Free America number 29, the first of our Iran-Contra shows, the one about drug smuggling. We're not going to release, we're not going to read the rest of it here. Suffice it to say, the rest of the article goes on to detail the involvement of all of these men with Edwin Wilson, the other members of the secret team, and the Nugan Hand Bank. We talked about Nugan Hand at considerable length in Radio Free America number 25. It has also figured in a prominent way in Radio Free America number 29 and Radio Free America number 31 as well. So the point here being that had the, uh, had the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee uh, gone into this a little deeper, or if they should in the future, the entire story or much of the story concerning the secret team, concerning the Triple Wilson Group and the Nugent Hand Bank, which, we, which uh, Nip can talk about here in a second, would have come out. However, Edward Zerinsky of Nebraska was not to be on that committee as it turns out, in fact, he was not to live more than a few hours after making uh, those very portentous statements. Indeed, and of course, as so often happens, when one man steps out, uh, another man steps in. A uh, person steps out, another person steps in, let's make it that way. Um, and we're going to read just a teeny bit about the man who succeeded Edward Zerinsky. This is uh, an article originally provided to us by Mae Brussel. 
for Thursday, March 12th from the San Francisco Chronicle, headlined Political Novice, Republican Named Nebraska Senator. And it talks about David Carnes, K-A-R-N-E-S, a Republican businessman from Nebraska who was appointed by Governor Kay Orr to replace Edward Zerinsky. And uh, it mentions that uh, apparently uh, Mr. Carnes, besides being a businessman, has only two qualifications for his job in the Senate, replacing Edward Zerinsky, um, were one that he worked with a, White, on a, with a White House fellowship in 1981, and uh, that, and I'll read this section, that, quote, his wife Elizabeth, who has written four books on education, previously worked for Barbara Bush, wife of the Vice President. Um, of course, you noticed uh, the article we read just a few minutes ago, the, the connections between uh, Felix Rodriguez, a.k.a. Max Gomez, and Donald Gregg, George Bush's national security advisor. One of the themes running underneath this whole Iran-Contra thing has been uh, the, the, the shadowy presence of George Bush. Um, the, as so far, uh, not reliably hammered down presence of George Bush. A lot of people have talked about it. Um, strangely enough, the people who be able to look into some of these things have not stu stuck around long enough to testify. And uh, again, so in and of itself, not tremendously significant that David Carnes' wife worked for Barbara Bush. However, it is interesting to see the Bush uh, network drawing closer and closer um, to the to the presidency and to the uh, the, the cover-up of the Iran Contra case. Again, Edward Zerinsky, a man who uh, seemed to be interested in getting to the bottom of uh, some of these things having to do with narcotics and terrorism. Uh, will not be around to chair that important subcommittee. It's interesting that the replacement, David Carnes, uh, was not only part of the George Bush circle of acquaintances, uh, obviously uh, his Carnes' wife had worked for Bush's wife, but uh, he also incidentally, though it's not mentioned in that article, was pro-contra. Now remember that the House, uh, the House Foreign Relations Subcommittee that uh, Edward Zerinsky was head of and that David Carnes is now a member of was investigating the Contra drug traffic and they were going to hear testimony, and I'm sure probably already have, of Mr. Betts, Morales, Betzner, Morales, and Tolliver. Tolliver talking about the uh, relationship between Felix Rodriguez and George Bush. An article about that very same relationship was, appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle of Monday, June 29th of 1987. This is a Newsday story, Dateline, Washington headline, Ex-CIA aide linked to Contra drug fund. A money launderer for a major Columbia cocaine cartel has told Congress in secret sworn testimony that he funneled nearly $10 million to the Nicaraguan Contras through former CIA operative Felix Rodriguez, congressional sources disclosed. Testifying behind closed doors before the Senate Narcotics and Terrorism Subcommittee on Thursday and Friday, Ramon Milian Rodriguez, who is serving a 35-year federal sentence for racketeering and related charges in connection with the narcotics money laundering, said the Medellin cartel believed it was currying favor with the CIA when it directed him to give the cash, a panel source said. Milian Rodriguez testified that the money was delivered in several installments after 1983 when he was arrested, the source said. The subcommittee source said that Milian Rodriguez claimed he passed the money in Central America to couriers selected by Felix Rodriguez. Two other, now, uh, let me interrupt this, Milian Rodriguez, he's the bag man, the money, pet, the payoff man for the Medellin cartel. Felix Rodriguez is the CIA man and uh, associate of Bush aide Donald Gregg. Two other panel sources confirmed that a cocaine money, la cocaine money launderer testified that he provided nearly $10 million in cash to the Contras through Rodriguez. The source who provided details of the testimony said that the panel staff had not yet been able to find the money in known Contra accounts provided to the panel by the Iran-Contra committees. The Rodriguez, who is also known as Max Gomez, helped oversee the airdrop of Contra supplies into Nicaragua from the El Salvador military base of Ilo, military air base of Ilopango. So the part of the specific nature of the drug connections here, the drug uh, trafficking connections of Felix Rodriguez, concerns the Medellin cartel. Now, this, this uh, again, this very important Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on the Terrorism, Narcotics, and International Communications, hearing testimony from people who can link George Bush to Felix Rodriguez, and in turn link Felix Rodriguez to the Medellin cartel, because uh, cocaine trafficking in general and the Medellin cartel in particular is going to be front and center as we take a look at the pile of corpses that uh, accompanies the breaking of the Iran-Contra investigation. 
another uh, cadaver turns up uh, in, in the same connection, the strange connection between uh, the folks that Dave has just been talking about, uh, George Bush, etc., uh, the Miami connection. And the article itself is from the Miami Herald for Friday, December 19th, 1986. And uh, the article's headline, Mercenary was afraid he would be killed, Naples' attorney says. The article is by Lori Rosa, or Rosa, R-O-Z-S-A, a Miami Herald staff writer, and it was provided to us originally by Ted Rubenstein. And it goes like this. The Naples attorney for Stephen Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, a self-described mercenary who fought briefly with the Nicaraguan Contras, said Thursday that Carr told him he feared he would be killed because of disclosures he made about illegal activities in the Contra movement. Quote, Steve had reasons and motivations to be fearful, Jerry Berry said. There were motives for foul play, unquote. Police in Los Angeles said Carr died Saturday at age 27 from an apparent drug overdose. The Los Angeles County Coroner is doing tests to determine how he died. Barry also disclosed, also disclosed Thursday that he has nine letters written by Carr that detail his charges concerning illegal weapons shipments to the Contras and a raid on the Sandinistas. Barry said the handwritten letters, some of them six pages long, were written to family members. He said Carr requested that the letters be made public, quote, if he met an untimely end. But Barry said he will turn the letters over to Carr's family rather than show them to the press. Quote, the majority of what is in the letters has already been disclosed by the press, Barry said. I think they may be helpful, unquote, to people investigating the Contras. Barry said Carr, quote, was concerned about John Hull being after him and indicated that he was concerned about the CIA not being very pleased with him, unquote. John Hull is a U.S.-born farmer who owns a ranch in northern Costa Rica and who is frequently linked to Contra activities. Carr was in the Collier County Jail from mid-May until November 20th for violation of probation. He was put on probation for a 1984 grand theft conviction. Carr returned to Naples in May after spending a year in jail in Costa Rica. While there, Carr told journalists about a weapons shipment from, a Broward, from Broward County to the Contras in Central America. In an August 18th letter made public Thursday, Senator John Kerry, Democrat of Massachusetts, told Collier Circuit, Circuit Judge Hugh Hayes that Carr should be released from jail early so he could testify in Washington. Quote, Information has been supplied to my office indicating that millions of dollars in military aid to the Contras has been diverted to private individuals and that persons associated with the Contra movement may have been involved with drug trafficking, Kerry wrote. Hayes refused to release Carr early. So Stephen Carr, another man who could have had some very important things to say about the, the illegal connection to the Contras, uh, about the connections of the Contras possibly to George Bush and other top administration of, uh, administration officials, to the uh, the key links between drug dealing and keeping the Contras alive, and as well, and not only the Contras but the mercenary movements in Central America, in other Central American countries funded by the United States. Uh, Stephen Carr, however, never did make it to testify. He wasn't let out of jail early, and uh, once he did get out of jail, things proved to be uh, not real good for him on the outside. Now, one of the things that we looked at in Radio Free America number 29 was the fact that in addition to uh, working with the Christic Institute, Carr was providing information to Senator Kerry, as talked about in that particular article. Now, Senator Kerry, Senator John Kerry of Massachusetts, is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, so he was on the same committee that uh, Edward Zerinsky was ahead of a subcommittee on and that was, was investigating this very same thing. Now, the death of Stephen Carr not only deprived uh, the investigators of a key witness, it appears that, uh, at least according to some people, that death was not an accidental overdose of cocaine at all. That is what the official version was. There are people who dispute that. Research credit on the following also goes to a listener. This is from In These Times, specifically from In These Times issue of, the, of April 15th to 21st of 1987. This is a story by Dennis Bernstein and Vince Bielski, and it's headlined, A whirlwind of death threats and wild accusations swirls around Contragate. It reads as follows. A key figure in the covert arms supply network threatened a congressional witness with death if the witness did not sign an inflammatory statement against a U.S. senator and others investigating the Iran-Contra scandal, a congressional source told in these times. 
John Hull, an American with dual citizenship in Costa Rica, delivered the threat to Peter Glibbery, G-L-I-B-B-E-R-Y, a British mercenary. Glibbery is imprisoned in Costa Rica for his involvement with the Contras fighting the Nicaraguan government. On Sunday, March 29th, in the crowded visiting area of La Reforma prison in Costa Rica, Hull told Glibbery he would be killed if he refused to sign an affidavit declaring that Senator John Kerry, Democrat of Massachusetts, Miami Public Defender John Matz, or Mates, M-A-T-T-E-S, and American reporters Tony Avergan and Martha Honey are communist, unquote, according to Dick McCall, an aide to Senator Kerry. All those named in the affidavit had investigated Hull in connection with the covert Contra supply network. Hull said in an interview that he did visit Glibri at the prison on March 29th, but he denied that he threatened the mercenary. Hull said he brought an affidavit for Glibri to sign, but claimed it did not mention communism. Quote, The affidavit said that Glibri took bribe money to accuse me of helping the Contras from Senator Kerry through Robert White's slush fund. Now, uh, remember the name Robert White. We'll be coming back to him later in the broadcast. To Robert White's slush fund. White former U.S. Ambassador to El Salvador, is now the president of the International Center for Development Policy based in Washington, D.C. Remember that organization, the International Center for Development Policy in D.C. After receiving the threat from Hull, Glibri called Mates. Quote, Hull told Glibri he would ruin his family and that Glibri would be killed, Mates told in these times. Kerry's Senate office also confirmed Hull's threat against Glibri. Hull is trying to scare Peter, Dick McCall said. I wouldn't take the threat lightly, unquote. According to Mates, Hull also told Glibri that the CIA had killed Stephen Carr, a federal witness who died in Van Nuys, California in 1986 of a suspected cocaine overdose. But Hull denied that he had said the CIA killed Carr. He said he told Glibri that the communists killed Carr, unquote. Glibri is a key witness against Hull for his alleged involvement with the Contras. Before his arrest, Glibri spent five weeks on Hull's ranch training the Contras. He and other congressional witnesses have provided investigators with the details of an extensive Contra military operation, complete with airstrips and weapons depots, based on Hull's property on the Nicaragua Nicaraguan border. In an interview, Glibri said that Hull told him he was, quote, the CIA liaison to the Contras, unquote, and as such was, quote, receiving $10,000 a month from the National Security Council to support this Contra operation, unquote. Others in the Contra network have linked Hull to the CIA, but Hull denies having military ties to the Contras or to the U.S. government. Glibri also said that Hull was involved in a March 1985 arms shipment from Miami to the Contras. Questioned in Costa Rica by an assistant U.S. attorney, Glibri said he witnessed the arrival of the weapons to Hull's ranch. In November of 1986, a federal grand jury was impaneled in Miami to investigate the shipment. And according to Mates, the House Judiciary Committee will soon travel to Costa Rica and to, and to talk to Glibri about the shipment. Mates said the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will also examine Hull's alleged connection with cocaine traffickers. During that investigation, drug smugglers are expected to testify that Hull allowed them to use airstrips he controlled in northern Costa Rica to refuel their cocaine-laden planes. Before his arrest for violating Costa Rica's neutrality, Glibri worked in 1985 as a Contra trainer on Hull's land with Stephen Carr. Mates said that Hull reportedly told Glibri, quote, You'll wind up dead like Stephen Carr. Don't you know the CIA killed Carr? Unquote. That last sentence again. Mates said that Hull reportedly told Glibri, quote, You'll wind up dead like Stephen Carr. Don't you know the CIA killed Carr? Unquote. In 1985, Carr said that Hull threatened his life. In a letter to his mother, he wrote, quote, I'm supposed to be shot. A guy by the name of Morgan Felipe Vidal, who worked for the FDN, and John Hull have been given orders to shoot me and Pete Glibri because we spoke out against John Hull. Although the Los Angeles coroner's office says Carr died of an accidental cocaine overdose, the coroner is unable to explain three needle-sized puncture marks on Carr's left elbow. That last sentence again. Although the Los Angeles coroner's office says Carr died of an accidental cocaine overdose, the coroner is unable to explain three needle-sized puncture marks on Carr's left elbow. The marks were made a short time before his death. And uh, that is uh, a very, very interesting thing for Stephen Carr to have on his elbow, particularly when someone allegedly told 
a another uh, contra turncoat, so to speak, uh, Stephen Glibery, that uh, he might be killed just like Stephen Carr, who was killed by the CIA, and then there's these three unexplained needle-sized puncture marks on uh, Carr's elbow uh, raise a lot of questions about the bona fides of the cocaine overdose theory. Uh, that is a very, very strange place to be injecting cocaine. Indeed. And the beat goes on, folks. Don't worry, there's lots more bodies yet to come. Uh, we are, for those of you who want to uh, fiddle with your tape recorders, we're just about to take a break in a moment and uh, play some music and uh, stretch and do all those kinds of things. And when we come back, we will have more of the same, namely mysterious deaths and break-ins, uh, the, uh, the, the untold story of the Iran-Contra case, uh, the kind of stuff that doesn't get talked about very much um, in the national news media. Uh, the stories float out one at a time, but the the overall picture is not examined, and tonight we've already seen seen three or four or five, I can't even remember how many deaths so far, uh, that seem to be rather interestingly tied in, and we've got a lot more coming, folks. It's depressing, but it's true. Anyway, this is Nip Tuck Dave Emery, and I will return.